Uh, hello, welcome to uh, SUNY History of Jazz Week 8. Uh, there will be three short videos this week. Uh, the first, an introduction to post-bebop improvisation from about 1956 until about 1958, a brief period, 59, uh, 60, a little, but this this sort of half a decade period leading to uh, many revolutions that happened in 1959 say revolution again, I'm talking kind of ev evolutionary, really. Um, but so the late 50s, let's say, into the very beginning of the 1960s, um, what was happening after bebop? This first video will address, um, again, some of that background, and then uh, a track by Sonny Rollins, who you will remember from the first week playlist as a sort, as sort of emblematic of the consummate a soloist and improviser and spontaneous composer. Um, we'll be talking about Sonny Rollins' Blue Seven. Okay, so uh, from John Swed's S Z W E D, from John Swed's Jazz 101, he writes about this seminal few years. For some years, musicians had been quoting from other songs in their improvisations or interpolating fragments of older songs into new ones. Think of Armstrong as an example, right? Uh, and most, in fact. It says this practice became even more self-conscious and common in the 1950s. Jazz needed to go somewhere, right? It was already evolving. It evolved into bebop and, and bebop's refractions that we, we start to discuss uh, in, in your midterm projects. It needed to evolve further. Swed writes, such quotations could be no more than phrases that fit harmonically and rhythmically, or they could be humorous commentaries on the current song, or merely citations to connect to an existing musical literature. And he says, quite rightly, quotation and citation point to a problem with jazz improvisation that was becoming more apparent in the 1950s, as stylism was essentially the... Uh, uh, not the, not the, the goal, per se, but various strains of bebop as it became post-bop and its many refractions, hard bop, cool jazz, etc. Uh, in innovation was uh, needing to uh, emerge somehow from these various strains. You see, he writes, musicians were either improvising by playing on the chord structure, so again, 32-bar song form, a 12-bar blues form, uh, as being the most common forms that they're being played on, but a cycle of chords, an A section, another A section, the bridge, the A, the B section, and then another A at the end, right? The same thing, then a contrasting section, same thing twice, a contrasting section, and then that first thing twice again, that 32-bar form broken into eights, or the 12-bar blues, again. Um, it says, with the chorus as their formal unit, as in the thing that is the identifier in how a song is organized for so much jazz at this time, by then, had crystallized into 32-bar song form. Again, 12-bar blues as well. Um, and so either using those chords as the whole basis of your improvisation, what am I going to play now that it's allegedly spontaneous? Well, I'm going to uh, make up some notes in different orders based on the chords going by in the eight bars, in the A, in the A, in the B. You change the chords you're improvising off, then back to the A, the original chords, making melodies out of those stacks of notes. That's what harmonic improvisation implies. It says, or embellishing the given melody. So whether you're just taking a melody, and uh, he, Swed mentioned this sort of humorous commentary and quoting other songs, whether you're taking a melodic unit and just kind of breaking it apart and reconstituting it, or you're improvising on the chord tones themselves, either way, he says, the problem was that there was a lack of cohesion and unity in the performance as a whole. That's a an umbrella statement, but again, it's implying something about the need for um, uh, for innovation to come from soloists, from comp composers, from ensembles. Where was it going? How was jazz going to progress? So it writes: one solution to the problem was to arrange and compose music that structured the improvisation. This was a method common among musicians involved with Miles Davis's *Birth of the Cool*, which we heard last week, right? So he's saying one strategy is. Um, uh, what became known finally in the 1950s and 60s as third stream, this idea of a kind of almost classical, not almost, but a Western classical rigor in approaching uh, jazz composition as uh, through compose. So it's either you're taking the 32-bar song form and saying, let's do something longer and more involved with multiple strains, actually in some ways hearkening back to the earliest jazz, to ragtime and the like. But you know that, that, that the compositional solution or a sort of improvisational solution, if you will, 
Swed writes another solution to improvise on the melody rather than the harmony to stop making solos out of the chord tones and the passing tones in between them. Uh, and yet another was to build up solos from motives or shorter melody units. It was perhaps Sonny Rollins. Remember Rollins again, the solo, his the the cohesion of his solo statement from uh, I can't get started from uh, from the 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 uh, anything we've heard Rollins play at this point. Every one of his solos has this kind of logical construction. So at that with that in mind, then when we listen to Sonny Rollins' Blue Seven, okay. Uh, Gunther Schuller, an uh, uh, important composer and musicologist and, and uh, popularizer of uh, jazz musicians and composers of the 1940s, 50s, 60s, ever since, until his passing in his 90s, but a seminal figure in, in, in recognizing jazz as both a uh, form worthy of study and also of um, uh, a form as uh, rigorous and um, uh, substantial as uh, the Western classical canon that he came from. Uh, Gunther Schuh was also a musicologist and an an a music analyzer. He suggested that Sonny Rollins' solution, quote, to some of the problems that were beginning to plague improvisers in the 1950s was to find a way to unify the source material and the improvisation by varying small portions, motives, little cells, of the original composition, then linking them together with other portions, though not necessarily in their original order. Right? This is kind of extending the idea of citing bits of melodies from popular songs that you know, or from varying a melody in a sort of orderly fashion. Reconstituting those melodic kernels in different ways. Schuler's noting this in Rollins' playing. In the case of Blue 7, then, the first song on our YouTube playlist this week, Rollins, quote, uh, in, in, the, in uh, the solo, uh, played only with drums and bass, and the freedom from the usual chordal instruments seemed to liberate his thinking. At times, his variations were Parker-esque bursts of notes that doubled the tempo, but at others, they were merely a stripping down to essential, say, only two notes, a single interval, but shrewdly chosen ones. The same two notes can be heard uh, in other recordings of Rollins as well. Uh, it was the sort of device that Thelonious Monk had explored and recordings such as Mysterioso that we heard, uh, and something that Rollins may have learned from Monk during his stay with his band. Okay, so Rollins is this archetypal example of both um, stating coherently, stating improvisational materials coherently, making them make sense, if you will, stand up to rigorous analysis, right? And yet, play with a freedom that seems oxymoronic along the lines of how can something be both structurally coherent but also free and, and free to go anywhere. Rollins was able to, through his combination of tinkering with melodic fragments and with uh, uh, the sort of, in this case, the accidental freedom, uh, or not accidental, but you know, sort of the circumstantial, the ensemble freedom of not having a chordal instrument a piano or a guitar to state chords and say, I played this cluster of notes, pick those to make your solo out of. All of a sudden he's soloing with the rhythm section. In truth, the bass player suggests harmony as well in the lines that they that a bass player walks, but it's nowhere near as um, constraining as a guitarist or a uh, pianist or a vibraphonist, indeed any harmonic instrument who's articulating multiple notes and chords constantly reminding a soloist of the skeleton that the skeletal structure that they're soloing against. Bringing up the connection to Monk is also interesting, not only because of the sort of uh, stylistic, um, inspirational um, debt that Rollins and anybody who played in his band owes to Monk, and, and indeed most who didn't as well, but because it, uh, Sweat is touching on something that's important. Rollins played in Monk's band for some time, for a good chunk of time, and with that, came a kind of a, a distillation of Monk's ideas in Rollins' own playing. As we'll see later in the 1950s, uh, actually really contemporaneous to when, um, to, to the period we're talking about, to the late 50s, uh, when Coltrane ends up, John Coltrane ends up playing in Monk's band as well, and takes those, those ideas and uh, uh, that Monk offers as far as how to um, organize solos, how to, comp how to structure compositions, how to make the most out of a little, how to use what conventionally might sound dissonant or quote-unquote wrong and incorporate it meaningfully into solos, how to use space, all the great genius uh, innovations of Monk. Rollins, in this case, later Coltrane, and anybody really who played in his band, were able to witness firsthand, were able to play that with him every night, however long that lasted, some years in fact. As a result, Rollins 
either consciously or otherwise, in his own on his own recordings and his own bands. Also shows the influence then of all of those innovations from Monk as well as all those innovations of Parker's. Not that Rollins is a stylist. He took the, the innovations of other great masters and created his own distinct um, uh, 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 voice from those things that didn't, that doesn't sound like anybody else. And it didn't. So he did, as much as he was a, a stylist who perfected and extended, he also innovated by combining those various masterly influences in different ways. Uh, Swed writes, he can, Rollin shows how much can be done. We talked about this the first week. How much can be done with a theme of such a few notes, in this case of Blue 7, and how a coherent composition can be structured out of that. Okay, so that is not, um, we'll leave the text there for now. That is something we should be listening for. He takes the all the fast ideas of Charlie Parker, the double timing, uh, you know, sort of the bursting with ideas in a solo, the sp- sparseness of Miles Davis, who Rollins also played with, the angularity of Monk, and those combinations of all those things, while still being ultimately just as famous for quotation and citation as any other less masterful improviser, that is what, that is the genius of Sonny Rollins, is that his the voice that he ends up with, which is this kind of, again, this distillation of several distinct approaches, ends up being unique in that in that combination of ingredients that he's come up with. So that's a little bit about both the, both the, the era, post-bebop era, the, the middle of the, and end of the 1950s, um, that we hear Sonny Rollins is really blossom as this important uh, um, uh, soloist and, and band leader and figure in jazz, and also the other pieces that we'll hear this week. Uh, next video up will be some of the ensembles, uh, mid-1950s, early 1960s ensembles of Miles Davis. Uh, stay tuned for that.